Mary Agnes Maroney was born in Chicago, Illinois on May 9th of 1928, the first of two daughters to Michael and Catherine Maroney. The couple started their family just before the Great Depression hit. The family lived in poverty as Michael only made $15 per week passing out handbills. A relative of Catherine's wrote to a welfare agency and a paragraph on their plight was printed. The service did not normally disclose addresses, but through a slip, the family's address 5200 Wentworth Avenue was learned by a woman. On May 14th of 1930, Mary Agnes's mother answered a knock at her door and was greeted by a woman who claimed to have been sent by a social worker to deal with the Maroney's case. She was described as well-dressed, about 22 years of age, protruding teeth, and a cultured voice. The woman identified herself as Julia Otis. After Catherine disclosed the family's many problems, the woman asked if she could temporarily take Mary Agnes to California with her, adding that she will be unrecognizable and fat as a butterball. Catherine refused. After promising to return, the woman handed Catherine two dollars and left. The following day, the woman came back, this time with baby clothes, as Catherine was pregnant. The woman stated that she had arranged to get a better job for Catherine's husband, Michael, and offered to take Mary Agnes to a nearby store to buy her some clothes and shoes. Reluctantly, Catherine gave her consent. Later, she commented that Mary Agnes sobbed and refused to go with the woman, but was taken anyway. Mary Agnes and the unidentified woman never returned. Mary Agnes's parents reached out to the police and began to search for their missing daughter. The Maroney family received a letter from Julia Otis the day after she took Mary Agnes. It read, Please don't be alarmed. I have taken your little girl to California with me. I have hired a special nurse to take care for her. We'll be back in two months. By that time, you will be on your feet again and you will be able to care for her. She didn't even cry a bit. She is outfitted like a princess. In the meantime, I'll help all I can do to get you on your feet. Don't worry about her or anything else. When you get this letter, we'll be on our way already. As ever, Julia Otis. This was the last the Maronis ever heard from the woman who claimed to be quote unquote Julia Otis. Police scoured Chicago's railroad stations for any clue that Mary Agnes had been taken on a train. Two weeks after the kidnapping, a woman who identified herself as Alice Henderson sent the Maronis a letter in which she stated that Otis was her cousin and that she was love hungry because her own husband had a baby and passed away over the year before. Henderson never wrote again, and authorities state that the letter from Otis was written in the same handwriting as the one written by Henderson. Unfortunately, investigators were not able to find Mary Agnes or the woman who took her. Throughout the years, there were various sightings, but nothing that could be confirmed, and the case went cold. Stories about Mary Agnes would appear in the newspaper now and then, particularly when other children went missing. Her story eventually caught the attention of Chicago Daily News reporter Eden Wright, who noticed something about the Maroney family in a photo. All the members of the family resembled each other, the newspaper wrote. The Chicago Daily News convinced a California newspaper to print pictures of the Maroney family, hoping it would lead to Mary Agnes. The pictures were apparently spotted by a man who claimed one of Mary Agnes's sisters looked so much like his wife that it could have been her in the photograph. The woman is Mary McClelland, a 24-year-old housewife. In 1952, she came forward claiming that by looking at the photos of Mary Agnes's siblings, she suspected she was Mary, the missing girl. Six more siblings were born after Mary Agnes disappeared. Mary McClelland had been adopted within a year of the kidnapping by Charles and Nora Beck. Dr. Krauss, after studying and comparing her dental casts, named her as one of the family. Mary McClellan's skull and blood showed she was a Maroney, according to the doctor, and he said Catherine Maroney claimed to recognize her, which was not the case. On September 3rd of 1952, the Chicago Daily News ran the following words atop its front page, 22-year search for kidnapped baby ends. 
It claimed characteristics in McClellan's teeth helped identify her as Mary Agnes, and the newspaper arranged a meeting between McClellan and Catherine Maroney. Catherine said, She's a great lady, fantastic person. I wish she was my daughter, but no. An aging physician named Dr. E. W. Marathu stated that he delivered Mary McClelland to an unknown mother on November 17th of 1927, and that her mother provided a baby picture of her daughter dating from 1928, which proved she had been adopted two years before the kidnapping. Furthermore, Mary Agnes underwent an operation for a ruptured navel, but Mary McClellan did not have the scar Mary Agnes had at the time of her disappearance. Further DNA testing proved she was not Mary Agnes. She passed away in 2005. A DNA test performed in 2008, following Mary McClellan's passing, conclusively determined that she was not Mary Agnes. In February of 2023, it was announced that DNA testing had determined a link between Mary Agnes's surviving family and relatives of Jeanette Burchard, a Florida resident who passed away in 2003 at the age of 75. Jeanette Burchard was raised as an only child, married twice, had three children, and spent more than 50 years as a nurse. Jeanette's family was told that she was born on April 14th of 1928 and that her biological father passed away two months after she was born and that she spent the first six years of her life in Chicago. She was raised by Jeanette Solaric Darris Anderson and a stepfather, Frank Darris. The pair raised Jeanette as a devout Catholic. Jeanette married Edward Jennings. Decades later, she married again, that time to Earl Burchard. Both of her husbands have since passed away. Jeanette had three children, Terry Arnold, Barbara Joan Jennings, who passed away in 2006, and Edward Clifton Jennings Jr., who passed away in 2004. Jeanette's daughter, Terry Arnold of Florida, who is still alive, has suddenly found herself entangled in a historic Chicago cold case. Terry said she was contacted in September of 2022 by a Cook County detective who had questions about her late mother and asked if she would be willing to take a DNA test. At first, Terry thought it could not be right. Then she decided to take the DNA test just to prove the detective wrong. The results came back on October 28th of 2022 and revealed all was not as it seemed. Though the maternal side of Jeanette Burchard's family was Polish, Terry said her DNA results revealed she is not. She is mainly Irish. The Maronis are also Irish. Terry told the Chicago Sun-Times that she's since learned my family is completely different from what I was always led to believe. And she said she is very confident her mother was Mary Agnes. Terry said her mother loved her pets, opera, and the Miami Dolphins. Her life apparently began in Chicago, but most importantly, she was the world's greatest mom. We adored my mother. A granddaughter of Jeanette Burchard, Lori Hart, acknowledged the pain that Mary Agnes's disappearance must have caused the Maronis. But she said that she's still blessed to have had Jeanette Burchard as her grandmother. Anytime I needed her, she was there, Lori Hart said. Mary Agnes's nephew, 55-year-old Don Maroney of Downstate Flanagan, is also convinced his aunt has been found. Don, Terry, and Lori believe Jeanette Burchard was Mary Agnes because of the work of Cook County Sheriff's Office Detective Jose Rodriguez. He was assigned in June of 2022 to investigate Mary Agnes's disappearance as part of Sheriff Tom Dart's Missing Persons Project. Jose Rodriguez and Commander Jason Moran said commercial DNA testing revealed the genetic association between Terry Arnold and members of Don Maroney's family suggested they were all cousins. That left Terry trying to make sense of a new family history, but it also offered closure to the Maroney family, which has been at the center of the case for 93 years. Mary Agnes's mother, Catherine, was haunted by the loss of her daughter and fell into a deep depression. Catherine passed away in 1962 at the age of 49. She was only 17 years old when Mary Agnes was kidnapped. Mary Agnes's father, Michael, passed away in 1957 when he was 58. 
His final words were said to be, They never found my baby girl. Don Maroney said the family had always hoped whatever happened to his aunt, that she led a good life and she was taken care of, and she was. Terry said that she had never before heard the name Julia Otis, and she doesn't know how her mother came to be raised by Terry's grandmother. All I know is she ended up with her, and I just feel bad that the parents never knew what happened to their daughter. Either way, the Maroney family can honestly truly know that she was very much loved. Terry also said that if her mother was still alive to learn the news, she's sure that she would have reached out to the Maronis. She would have gone to the family and said, I am here, I am fine. Twenty-nine-year-old Mary Mathis Davis was last seen at Lanier's Hardware in Lexington, North Carolina, where she worked on May 30th of 1987. She worked for a brief period before failing to return after her lunch break. The next day, investigators found her body behind a Winn-Dixie store on East Center Street. She had been strangled and assaulted. Mary's husband, Richard Davis, recalled the last time that he saw her. I seen her that morning and I went to my sister's swimming and when we came back, we thought she would be home from work by then, said Richard. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the culprit from Mary's body. The DNA only became useful recently with advancements in DNA technology. Othram Inc. used forensic evidence to identify Russell Grant Wood as the person that took Mary's life. The announcement was made on February 3rd of 2023. Russell Wood, who was a Lexington resident, passed away in 2013. Police said he did not have a previous record. Investigators said that Mary Davis and Wood were acquaintances but did not know each other well. Mary Davis's daughter, Tracy Cleary, was one year old when her mother's life was taken. I've always heard that she was kind and sweet, and that she had a lot of patience and she just liked people," said Clary. She said she is relieved by the department's discovery because it brings closure and clears her father's name. I think it was more relief that all these things my whole life that I maybe have thought about or what it could be, it was all proven," said Clary. Police said they don't know what Wood's motive would have been, but if he was still alive, he would definitely be charged with taking Mary's life, kidnapping her, and assaulting her. Twenty-three-year-old Mary Robin Walter lived in Great Bend, Kansas in 1980. She is a wife, mother, and nursing school student. On January 24th of 1980, Police were called to Nelson Trailer Park near the airport in Great Bend about a shooting. When they arrived there, they found Mary's body. She had been shot multiple times. Investigators collected evidence and interviewed several people but obtained no useful information and the case went cold. In April 2022, Detective Sergeant Adam Hales reopened the investigation. After taking a fresh look at the case, it became evident to him that some of the information had been initially overlooked. In October of 2022, new evidence was discovered, but authorities declined to disclose it. On December 8th of 2022, 68-year-old Stephen Hanks of Burden, Kansas was arrested in connection with the case. Barton County Sheriff Brian Bellandier announced the arrest at a news conference. At 42 years and 10 months, we believe this is the oldest homicide arrest in the state of Kansas, Bellandier said. Bellandier said Stephen Hanks was investigated as a suspect immediately after the shooting. But the case went cold. He did not disclose a possible motive. I'm proud of my officers for clearing this case. Hopefully, it brings closure for the family and brings justice for the community," Bellandier said. These are long, complicated investigations and are tedious. The credit here goes to my people. Stephen Hanks spent time in prison for another crime. 
He was arrested in 1981 and charged with assault, battery, robbery, and burglary. He was sentenced in 1983 and discharged in 1993. In response to the break in the case, Mary Robin Walter's niece, Leslie Scrag, issued a statement on behalf of the family saying in part, we are grateful for the detective's efforts bringing this man to justice. Robin was truly beautiful inside and out, Scrag said. This world was robbed of her presence and we will never know how that has shaped our lives. The news is bittersweet. Many of those who knew Robin are gone. Her parents, husband, and a sister will not get to share in our collective relief that Robin's case will have a conclusion. Thirty-one-year-old Mary Catherine Edwards lived in Beaumont, Texas in 1995. She was a respected teacher and had a large circle of friends and a close-knit family. Mary was last seen on the evening of Friday, January 13th of 1995 at the new townhouse she just moved into. Her parents grew concerned the following day when she did not respond to phone calls. They went to her home to check on her welfare and they found a horrific scene. Mary had been drowned in her own bathroom. She had been handcuffed with her hands behind her back. An autopsy revealed that she had been assaulted as well. Investigators collected male DNA from her body and stored it for future use. For more than 25 years, the case remained unsolved. Then in April of 2020, investigators began using genetic genealogy to help find a suspect. They first found several distant cousins, which led them closer and closer to an arrest. Eventually, the DNA led them to Clayton Bernard Foreman. Foreman and Mary attended the same high school. They were also casual friends. Mary was even a bridesmaid at the wedding of Foreman and his first wife. Investigators also learned that the crime against Mary had similarities to a 1981 assault of one of Foreman's high school classmates. Foreman pleaded guilty to that crime and received three years of probation. Foreman was arrested in May of 2021 in Franklin County, Ohio where he lived and was charged with taking Mary Catherine Edwards' life. On Wednesday, September 22nd of 2021, Foreman was indicted. A date for the trial has not yet been released. Seventy-eight-year-old Mary Haig Kelly lived in Dallas, Texas in 1989. One morning in January, a family member of Mary stopped by her home to check on her. When he was unable to get Mary to answer the door, he feared that she might be sick or injured, so he used his personal key to enter the residence. He then found Mary's body under her bed and called the Dallas Police Department. Detectives determined there were several items missing from Mary's home, indicating that burglary could be the motive. There were no signs of forced entry. The Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy and found that Mary had been strangled. Several persons of interest were interviewed. Fingerprints that were also found at the crime scene were submitted for comparison. Ultimately, the comparisons revealed that not one of the persons of interest matched the evidence at the crime scene. The case information was submitted to the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program in hopes of finding any other possibly related cases. Pawn shops were contacted throughout the city to check for stolen items missing from Mary's home. Without witnesses to the crime, and with all leads exhausted, the case eventually went cold. Then, in November of 2021, the Dallas County District Attorney's Office teamed with Othram to see if advanced DNA testing could provide help in the 1989 case. Forensic DNA evidence from the crime scene was sent to Othram Lab. Their scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to develop a genealogical profile from DNA evidence. Othram's in-house genealogy team used the DNA profile to perform a genealogical search and were able to produce investigative leads that were submitted back to the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. 
The Dallas County District Attorney's Office working with Dallas Police Department continued the investigation and eventually identified 53-year-old David Rojas as the man responsible for taking the life of Mary Haig Kelly. He was identified on June 28th of 2022. Then on July 22nd, 53-year-old Rojas was arrested and charged with ending her life. Rojas' half-brother lived next door to Mary at the time of the crime. He was 20 years old back then. Police tracked down the half-brother in question and then used a six-pack of Bud Light he discarded to ensure it was David Rojas' DNA that was found on Kelly's body. The funding for Othram's DNA testing and genealogical research was provided through a grant from Season of Justice. The Season of Justice grant was awarded to Leighton D'Antoni from the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. Leighton D'Antoni had this to say, Working with Othram and the Season of Justice became a no-brainer. The results across the country speak for themselves. My job is to aggressively pursue justice in a responsible and ethical manner. Sometimes that requires us to go outside traditional investigative methods to solve our most difficult cold cases. In the last 33 years, countless people have put in hundreds of hours of investigative work on the Mary Kelly cold case. But at the end of the day, it was Othram that solved this difficult case. Othram performed the necessary forensic testing and was able to put those results to work identifying our suspect. This case does not get solved without them. David Rojas is being held at the Dallas County Jail on a $750,000 bond. Twenty-year-old Mary Jane Thompson lived in Dallas, Texas in 1984. She had previously lived in Houston and Los Angeles, but decided to move to Dallas in 1983. Mary worked at a florist shop and also a restaurant. She had dreamed of becoming a model. Mary was last seen taking a bus to a medical clinic on February 11, 1984. Two days later, her body was found behind a warehouse in Dallas. She had been strangled by her own leg warmers and also assaulted. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the culprit from the scene for it to be used later. In 2009, a DNA profile was created for the suspect, but it did not match anyone in the database and the case went cold. In 2018, Dallas police decided to reopen the case. This time, DNA was much more advanced and they worked with a team from the district attorney's office and the FBI. The DNA profile of the suspect was submitted to the public DNA databases. Then finally, in February of 2021, investigators determined that 60-year-old Edward Morgan's DNA matched the DNA collected at the crime scene back in 1984. Morgan was arrested and is currently being held at the Dallas County Jail. Dallas County Assistant District Attorney Leighton Diatoni said, Working together, we continue to solve the most difficult cold cases that Dallas has ever seen. I look forward to working with all our local law enforcement agencies to utilize the advancements in forensic testing techniques to identify, arrest, and prosecute the most dangerous predators hiding among us. We never ever forget about these cases, our victims, and their families. After the arrest, Mary's sister, Selena Tomasello, posted several messages and a montage of family photos on Facebook. Missing you, sis. On Friday, when I got a call I have been waiting 38 years for. He will be in jail for the rest of his life. He is no longer free as a bird. I know you are looking down. Mary Prier and her husband Leonard lived in Flint, Michigan. They owned Sweet Marie's Candy Store for many years before selling it. They then moved to Lennon, Michigan to retire. In 1990, Leonard passed away. In the years since his passing, Mary became a fixture in the small village. She was a devout Catholic and often attended church functions. Lennon residents remember seeing her walk from home to the town diner for lunch and dinner most days. On February 27, 1997, Michigan State Police canine teams, taking part in training in the area, found 88-year-old Mary's body in a wooded area near her residence. She had been beaten, strangled, and indecently assaulted. It was a crime that shocked the small Lennon community. Investigators collected DNA at the crime scene that belonged to the suspect. They also conducted hundreds of interviews to gain evidence in the case and followed up on dozens of leads. 
Quickly, they zeroed in on Michael Burr. He lived in a residence a short walk from Mary's house. Investigators took his DNA sample so that it could be stored, as DNA was not advanced enough at the time to confirm that his matched what was found at the crime scene. Unfortunately, investigators could not gather enough evidence to meet the probable cause standard necessary to charge him in the connection to the case. Recently, the Genesee County Police Department partnered up with Michigan State Police Crime Lab to finally help solve the case. In November of 2021, they were able to match the DNA found at the scene to that of Michael Burr. Genesee County Prosecutor David Layton said, The DNA evidence shows a 1 in 1.9 octillion chance that Michael was not responsible for what happened to Mary. Ultimately, what we all want here is closure for the victim's families, he said. We want closure because when you lose a loved one in such a brutal manner, it never goes away from your mind. You never have a peaceful day when you can't stop thinking about it. Michael is currently being held in Genesee County Jail without bond. He is now scheduled for a probable cause hearing in Genesee County District Court on November 24, 2021, when prosecutors will lay out the evidence against him.